Hello, everyone out there. Welcome to another Comic Crusaders podcast. I am your host for the evening. I am Bracey. And tonight I will be talking with uh, production designer Merrick Dobrovolsky, a man who has uh, got at least 50 movies to his credits and numerous TV shows. So he carries a weight, a great weight of experience and looking forward very much to talking with him on the subject. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you so much for being here. Very happy oh, it's to uh, pleasure. make your acquaintance and pick your brain a bit. Pardon me if you see me looking off screen. I've got my questions no, no. here. Look on the screen. Have your questions. Now, the first question I have is, uh, first and foremost, for those out there who are not aware, because usually when we think about movie and TV production, we're usually just thinking about the actors uh, on the stage or the people working behind the camera, like your director or maybe even your cinematographer. But uh, for our audience out there, tell us a little bit about uh, what production design is and uh, what it is that you do. Production design is what uh, years ago was called art direction. So I'm in charge of the art direction of the whole movie or series. And that means uh, I make a decision with and present to the director the look of the movie. You know, once I get a script, I do research, I try to put up the concept that it's a period movie, it's a little more complicated, if it's contemporary, it will still be a concept. And uh, you talk with the director and the producers of the show, uh, is it a TV series, a, a mini series, or a feature? It's the same process. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is time frame. You know, if it's a pilot, it's shorter. If it's eight episodes, like now I'm doing Justified, the reboot of Justified City Premier, based on Elmer Leonard uh, book novel, actually, which the original pilot years ago was based on too, which I also did. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever the audience sees on screen uh, visually is a decision that the production designer has to make in collaboration, of course, with the director and the producers and the cinematographer who starts it later. I, as a designer, start the process much earlier uh, with the director. We start locations, so we design sets. Uh, I have a whole team of people depending on the scale and the size of the project. There's more or less people, you know, you have 10, 20, 30, 40, hundreds sometimes. So whatever you see that is under the visual aspect of the movie, it is the production designer has a stamp on it. All right, well, let's get into that a little bit. Um, given that uh, you, it's, uh, movies are a very collaborative effort, and um, how much... I don't want to. Let's like, how much input do you have uh, versus, say, like the the director or the art department or uh, the cinematographer? Is it uh, like do I'm they do the a parameter and then you kind of do this and there's that feedback there? I am the art department. Mm -hmm. So uh, I work with the director. As I mentioned, uh, I take a script or a book. If there's a book before the script, but there's always a script or an outline of a script or outline of uh, mostly most scripts the, the first time you read it is a script and then uh, on the basis of of the story that's there i come up with uh, an idea and say okay this is present day detroit like i'm doing right now uh, or it's 14th century england or it's uh, world war ii or it's a futuristic project like Supernova that I design. Mm -hmm. And then, depending on the scale of the project and how much work there is, the producers decide what the budget is. And on the basis of that, we say, okay, we have 12 weeks of pre production or we have three months of pre production. It all depends. Now, when it comes to things like uh, lighting, you're going to be responsible for all the uh, lighting implements on there, like if there's a table lamp and stuff like that. Uh, when you work with the cinematographer on that, um, he's obviously going to have lights outside of the frame. Are, are you as responsible for everything that's in the frame as a, the director and the cinematographer? Again, is there that sort of cohesion there? Or Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, I have a team of people who are art directors, uh, you know, set designers that they draft the sets. Uh, uh, and a very important person is the set decorator. 
So talking to the director, talking to the cinematographer about the style of the movie, uh, we decide about the practical lighting, as you mentioned, you know. So we have practical lighting that, uh, that we put on the set, and that's something that the decorator does. And uh, I talked to the decorator and we discussed with the, the cinematographer, show him different practicals. And we talked about the sets that if we're building a set on stage, you know, now using digital cameras, uh, you don't uh, light from the top. You have much, much less uh, lights because you, you, you have a bigger aperture, you know, you can, you can shoot in ne nearly in darkness, you know, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the one advantage of, uh, of uh, video and I mean digital process uh, or disadvantage, you know, uh, you uh, decide about how it's lit, uh, how uh, how the camera is moving in the sense that from this one room I need to see the other room and you have to figure out what it is. If it's a set, then you really design to the needs that the director has and he kind of walks you through those elements. We do storyboards uh, on the basis of the action or the story that the director wants to say and that those storyboards are done by the director in consultant in consultation with the cinematographer and with the production designer because on the basis of the set you know they they make those decisions well keeping on the track of this uh this visual aesthetic then uh and that brings up an interesting point about the the digital versus the film days yeah i know there are still some uh directors out there who use film and uh, I'm all for it. I figure whatever tool Absolutely. is the best for the job. In this case, uh, a lot of people have gotten into, for the, the past several years now, uh, color grading. And there, there used to be, and I, I suppose there still is, but uh, uh, somebody will have an idea, whether it's the director or the writer or what have you, or uh, production designers like yourself, for the, the palette of the film, if you will. Um, how has the digital process changed that for you as is color in the scene as important as it used to be knowing that somebody might just process the crap out of it or how do you handle that yeah i mean we talk in the beginning uh the style of the movie and we talk that yes it's going to be a, a film which has all the saturated colors or it's going to be degraded or it's going to be processed in such a way that uh, we saturate the colors and all those things are easier with the digital process mm -hmm. but when we had film a lot of decisions were made prior to uh, how you shoot for example when we talk we don't want primary colors then everybody through the project had uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the rules, we set up the rules. So uh, there was a rule, oh, we don't use red, we don't use primer uh, colors. So uh, we talked to the people who supply the cars, no primer colors in the cars. We look for locations that don't have primer colors. And from that, we build that visual language. And uh, what you were talking about for a moment in the beginning was uh, how you change the color, how you grade the, the film mm -hmm. after its process. So what happened, that's, and that's purely uh, cinematographer's uh, job, after you shoot the movie, after an in digital world is, uh, is uh, uh, much easier and it's done in such a way that when you shoot the movie, you try to get as much exposure as possible so you get all the information, digital information on the chip. Uh, that means you kind of shoot wide open if that means anything to, 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 to people. And then after the movie is uh, cut, the director and the, uh, the director grades the film. That means he plays with all the different tools. And there's so many different tools that uh, it's a completely different, uh, it, it could be a program by itself, you know? Like for example, you see the window behind me. This mm -hmm. window could be, like in Photoshop, you can take that window in film too. And this window, the color could be changed behind it. If it's too strong, it could be less, or you want it stronger. So all those things are uh, are played with uh, by the cinematographer, and and very often you do that with the visual effects uh, uh, team. Uh, all the visual effects, like outside the window, 
we had a green screen because we were on stage and we want to put the view of Chicago. So we have those plates and they put those views in post and then everything has to be uh, blended in. So mm -hmm. it works. But in a way, it's something which is outside the production designer's uh, work because it happens after you shoot the movie. When the movie is shot, uh, my job is finished. I supervise uh, or consult very often if it's visual effects. If there's a lot of visual effects. If it's a sci-fi movie or if it's a project that has a lot of visual effects, and on some of those projects, production designers would stay longer to make sure that the visual effects that are done are done accordingly to the style and the concept of the movie because they're extension of sets right you want to maintain a certain continuity throughout the film then absolutely yes and in the old days you know when you did not have digital the visual effects where you had uh, a blue screen and green screen uh, a lot of those designs uh, were done by the art by the production designer when i did uh, supernova I work with Digital Domain, uh, the visual effects house, and I designed the spaceship. And they built the spaceship as a miniature, big, huge miniature, uh, 20 something feet uh, long. And uh, uh, all the concept of the, of the space was designed <clears throat> in, with concept illustrators, but it was 2D, in, in, uh, 2D pictures, images. And then those 2D images were translated into 3d models um, and now everything's built you know in 3d directly you don't shoot uh, models like you did 20 years ago for example yeah or 40 years ago you had matte paintings and you had uh, 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 false perspective uh, sets you know uh, uh, before in front of camera uh, miniatures you know that had to all blend in no, no, I get it. I'm a, I'm a very big fan of uh, a lot of the old school effects. Uh, I used to watch how like uh, the mad paintings used to be painted on glass uh, for certain yes. to, to be lit from behind, so you could get like twinkling lights in the skies or lights coming from city buildings. And I but also, so, sorry to interrupt, but also it was oh, painted yeah. on glass because it was in front of camera, so you could see the image behind. Uh, the glass was translucent, so the, only the, in, the the things painted were the things that uh, appear in the, in the image, the final image. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a sand, like a sandwich, you know. Yeah, it's it's so neat to see those old techniques and, uh, like you said, the forced perspective. Which, uh, if, if anybody wants to see forced perspective in real life, uh, go to Disneyland and look at the uh, the castle. It's actually mm -hmm. a, a forced perspective shot done in uh, in real scale out there. So that's pretty cool. But with the the freedom of digital, obviously, there is a great deal you can do there. And uh, uh, just a tremendous amount of flexibility if you have the money to make it look very good. But on with the with the production design, uh, I think we've pretty much got your goal across as a production designer. Uh, is there anything you find a particular challenge when uh, trying to do production design for a project? Well, it all depends on the scale and the, the subject, you know, because it's always a challenge, you know. If you do a pilot, which is a contemporary pilot, the, the challenge is smaller. You look for locations, you look for, for what fits in the project. If you're doing a period movie, let's say 14th century England, uh, like I did The World Without End, based on Ken Follett's uh, book, then you have to actually create that 14th century. Uh, we shot in Hungary, we shot in Slovakia, in Slovakia I found castles. And I found uh, a cathedral that actually was built by the, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Franz Josef. But the interior of the, of the uh, cathedral we shot uh, in a different place. So you shoot the exterior one place, interior shoot in a different place. Then we build part of the exterior of the cathedral on the location on uh, on our back lot, for example. So, but when you go inside, you go to the real cathedral. So challenges are just uh, by the dozen, you know. That's actually one of my favorite aspects of uh, uh, what we call movie magic is uh, that you'll see an exterior and that's one location and an interior might be several different places or even a set. Uh, there was this uh, French horror film called uh, High Tension in which mm -hmm. they shot in this convenience store, but they needed a very large bathroom for the setup they had. 
and it was like a bus terminal bathroom, something that could never fit in this convenience store. And I thought that was very clever to use the get the sort of shot they wanted. And so I, I appreciate what you're doing there with the castles. And since you uh, brought up World Without End, let's get into that a little bit. The uh, uh, period pieces uh, or fantasy pieces have their uh, own challenges, uh, constraints and freedoms, I imagine. But here you've got a world that's uh, you know full of basically medieval technology, wear, weapons, armor. Uh, where do you end up sourcing things like that? Uh, how much is it is stuff you just have to fabricate or do you have sources where you can get some of these stuff, some of these things for your production? It all depends, you know, where you're working in which country. Like, for example, uh, the advantage of shooting in England is that you have the, the best prop houses in the world. You know? mm. And uh, you go to some of those prop houses and uh, let's say you go on the fourth floor and you can see set dressing that was used or manufactured or put together for the gladiator, you know. You mm -hmm. go to another floor, uh, which was Rome, right? Uh, and you go to another floor and you have all medieval uh, uh, furniture and props. So, uh, it, so it all depends, you know, uh, for, for this, you have to have a, a, a historical background. Uh, you have to like history and history of art and you have to know how to do the research. And then uh, in countries like Hungary or Slovakia or my native Poland, you can find artisans who can reproduce a lot of things, you know, from the past, because the, the craftsmanship has not died yet, like in more advanced countries, like for example, here in the States, you know, when I did uh, Into the West, uh, uh, that was produced by Stephen Spielberg about the American West, the Native Americans, uh, the Lakota uh, uh, nation, uh, we hired uh, a lot of the Lakota people to build and paint the teepees, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael Bond, the costume designer, hired a whole team of, of uh, seamstresses and, and artisans that uh, would saw the beads and stuff like that. And our prop masters did the same thing. So it all depends on the, the variety of projects, who you're using and how you're putting it all together. That's uh, that's really cool that you actually got the, the native people to create the teepees because uh, looking at Into the West, uh, that's a project that takes you to many, many, many locations. Uh, were all those were all those shot in basically sort of the same area, or did you? Because you're no. natural locations there. Are you just trying yes. to dress it with this with the items on there to make it look like different areas? Yes, what we did is, this was a six-part, two-hour miniseries. It start, the story started in the 1820s with the mountain men going from the east to the west and, and the, uh, through the mountains. Um, and uh, that's where it was the fur trade. So uh, we shot it in Calgary, Canada. We started that project in Calgary, Canada. In Calgary, Canada, there are, there's the Blackfeet tribe. So we asked the Blackfeet uh, tribe to help us with a lot of the research. We had a historical uh, and a culture consultant who actually became one of the actors in the movie, uh, Joseph Marshall III, who is a Lakota native. And uh, he would uh, be the advisor, uh, culture advisor in helping me and the decorator and, uh, and the director about the authenticity of what we are doing. When Spielberg um, wanted to do the project, he told me that he wants to tell a story that was never told. Hmm. And uh, the producer, uh, David Rosemont, uh, told me a couple of months or weeks, probably weeks after uh, I started working with him on the project, he said that uh, uh, also what Spielberg uh, wanted is he wanted to hire somebody who has never done a Western because this project is not about 1860s and the Western town. It is about the whole culture of the, of the 1820s to 1890s of what happened in the West. So it was more of a historical research. And they looked at the movie that uh, the series that I did uh, a year before which was called Hitler, the Rise of Evil, for which I got an Emmy. 
which was about recreating 19, uh, 1917, uh, 1914, World War One, and then going until until 1935, the Weimar Republic, and how Hitler got the power. So the same approach I had to the story of the Native Americans and the real makers coming from from Missouri, finally reaching California. You know, so. We do research, I do research as a, I would be doing a historical movie. I did not look at any Westerns, I didn't want to be influenced by some great Sergio Leones, for example, or, or other great West, Westerns, or, or John Wayne's Westerns. I mean, you have a culture of Westerns here, right, in mm -hmm. this country. But uh, 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 what I was interested in, in trying to recreate the exact, how it really looked, you know, there's this whole controversy now about uh, uh, about Jane Campion's movie that uh, it was shot in New Zealand, that it's not the West, uh, it's not Montana, but uh, it was so authentic what they did, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they did it there because of some financial reasons, and she's from, from uh, New Zealand, but it doesn't matter where she's from, they try to recreate that world and uh, I think uh, uh, they did a fantastic job in creating that world, you know? And you, you shoot movies all over the world, and it doesn't mean that you shoot in the places where it happened. So going back to, to, to um, into the West, we started, as I mentioned, in Calgary, and then we went through the different historical periods. After that, we were wagons going West, from, also from Missouri, you know? So all the scenes with wagons, with wagons, with oxen, we have wagons with horses. So you have to find those, you have to find the, the wranglers who have wagons. You have to build wagons, those prairie schooners, that's the, that some of them were called, the, the huge ones. And then you put all this together, uh, you have the script, you figure out the locations, and then you shoot that sequence. Then it went on to uh, be a whole sequence about, because the movie was divided into two parts, in, in a kind of two worlds. One was the white man's world, and the other one was the world of Lakota Indians. So two completely different worlds, uh, um, and, and, and that's where the conflict uh, 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 arrived, you know, between the two cultures. And uh, 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 then it went through the Indian Wars, and then uh, the Gold Rush, uh, so for that sequence, uh, we finished the gold rush in Calgary. I built those sluices, uh, gold, gold uh, uh, sluices where people would uh, would look for gold on the river, which was um, imitating the the uh, California gold rush, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we finished shooting in December and everything froze, and I remember we moved to, to, from Calgary to New Mexico to do the second part, which uh, took place uh, from the plains uh, towards California. Uh, and uh, that's where we build um, the railroad, the two, uh, ra uh, the two trains meeting in the promontory point. We built probably four miles of tracks, with all those elements, how they build the Road. Then we had to turn the, the locomotives around. So it's a big logistics deal, and everything has to be done so we experience so you can photograph it. We have to that's, build house on wheels, a town, and that's that's pretty impressive. Actually, having to build some uh, some working railroad track that some trains were going to be run on. That's yeah, we had to. We rented two trains, which were replicas of those trains from two different museums. One was in Texas. One was in Sacramento, I think, and they came on, on flat, uh, you know, uh, uh, flat, uh, flat, uh, tra not train, but they were pulled by, yeah, they were on a, a, a like a trailers, you know, fr flat trailers, mm -hmm. just, just uh, uh, above the ground, a couple of inches, so they could go under the different uh, overpasses, you know. Mm. So, so uh, it's. It's a lot. I, I worked on it for 12 months on this mm. project. It was finally six parts of, of, of uh, two hours each, 12 hours. Big project. So uh, it's interesting. You, one of the words you used there was authenticity. 
And I was, uh, I was thinking about that, how, uh, de depending on the project, obviously, you're going to be going for either authenticity, uh, accuracy, or just the settings. If you uh, think of something like the, uh, the Gilo films or like Suspiria, where uh, Argento had a very uh, stylized look that he was going for mm -hmm. in his sort of films. Um, but that's, that's really going to be uh, another conversation with production, yourself, and all that to determine that sort of thing. On top of that, though, thinking about the uh, both the stylization or the the approach, and uh, one of the things in particular I like what you mentioned about the uh, Into the West is you have two different points of view here. Now, when I was looking at Mr. Mercedes, uh, I thought this played in in a smaller scale, and I thought it was very interesting where you have your detective, your retired detective, who gets caught up in this manhunt for the serial killer and the serial killer himself. And tell me a little bit what you do to create these spaces that uh, gives us the mood, the emotion, the intent that that shows the extension of the character because they're they're each very different people. You know, one's one's old, one's young. You know, one's a detective, one's a serial killer. Uh, they have different ethics, different moralities, and I see that reflected in the spaces they inhabit. Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so that was a very interesting project uh, uh, directed uh, uh, by uh, Jack Bender. I worked with Jack Bender before. I did Under the Dome, another Stephen King adaptation of the book. We mm -hmm. also did uh, for TNT, The Last Ship, we did two seasons of that. And then Mr. Mercedes came along. Uh, David E. Kelly, uh, the, the, the wonderful writer uh, of television, uh, penned the scripts and he wrote all of them. Uh, himself and uh, uh, Jack directed several episodes. I think we had 10 episodes altogether, and he directed probably four or five, uh, and there were a couple of other directors in between. So I had to create the world of the detective, you know, uh, and uh, uh, retired uh, from, from the force. Uh, and we found a house uh, that. Uh, I thought we we're going to shoot the exterior only and then build the interior on stage because very often you want to be on stage the process is faster you don't have to get mm -hmm. locations and this is how the studios are trying to to condense the shooting schedule but what we liked about the house and what jack liked about the whole setup was the fact that you looked out the window and you were there you were there in this location the corner of that street you see the kids playing hockey, uh, uh, you saw uh, the neighbor that he has a relationship with, um, and play, played by uh, Miss Holland. Uh, so uh, we decided that we are going to refurbish the house. The house was partly burned, and we loved the architecture of it. It was built in the 30s, and we restored the house. We rebuilt it, and huh. a couple of tricks uh, I had to use were I would open the walls so we could be with the camera outside looking into the room because the spaces are small. So we did covers that we could remove and things like that because we do it all the time on stage, but very often on locations it's harder. But because of the fact that this house was uh, in a bad condition, we restored it later for the owners and we were able to have a free uh, run and we could uh, do three seasons in that house. That and is, then, oh, I'm sorry, it's like I was going to yeah. comment. That's, that's really neat because uh, for those out there who don't know, uh, typically when you're having a studio shoot, you know, there's this process they call the fourth wall. You have three walls of the structure, and then the outside wall is your view, the camera. And uh, I'd never heard of anybody going into an actual physical location and taking out a roll, wall so you've got that freedom and space to actually do what you need to do. So that was really cool to hear. Yeah, I just need to take the charger to my connect the computer. Oh, um, sure thing. We just got home, folks, and jump on the screen. Make sure his battery yeah. is in the middle of this. Yes, yes. So sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. Uh, that's all right. I've, I've actually uh, 
uh, shamefully have had my uh, my phone or my laptop uh, cut off in the middle of something because yeah. it's easy to overlook so, at times. So so uh, so we had uh, Brendan Gleeson play the detective, fantastic Irish actor, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what we did with Harry, the serial killer. We built everything on stage. Ah. We, we only had a, a house uh, from the exterior that we went a couple of times to see the house. There was a fire. Uh, uh, so we saw it only from the, from the outside. But the house on stage with his basement where he was uh, working, where he was putting all those videos uh, that he was haunting uh, Brandon, and uh, where he had his layer of, uh, of uh, all those crazy things that he was doing. That was built on stage. So we had the house, the ground floor, uh, the living room, where he, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the kitchen and the foyer and entrance. This was one set. Then it was a separate set, uh, the basement, the staircase and going to the basement. Mm -hmm. That was his kingdom. And then there was a separate set was uh, the bedroom upstairs, but later on uh, when the house burns and he, uh, he, because he kills his mother, he kills his, uh, his uh, uh, boss, uh, and then he burns uh, the house uh, and charms the, the bodies. Yeah, that's, that's really neat. I, I like paying attention to things like that when it's, uh such an intimate drama because this focus is very much on on two particular characters but even in the broader sense like into the west because it's it's definitely separate point of views that you can take as an aggregate of uh, a couple of different peoples i like seeing how the environment reflects the person and uh what they may or may not be going through at the time or you know what their mental state is or their um uh, emotional state is uh, uh and sometimes uh, some directors get a little interesting and even subversive with it. If you think about the works of Stanley Kubrick, how he's always putting uh, interesting things to look at in the background <laughs> of, uh, of his sets, uh, particularly The Shining. <laughs> yes. Well, the, the frame, you know, it's very important mm -hmm. that you're able to convey to the audience what's in the frame is what they see. You know? Right. If it's, if it's not in the frame, it doesn't exist, as they say. Yes. Now, you mentioned The Last Ship, and uh, I'm ex-military myself, and one thing I look for whenever I'm uh, watching anything that deals with the military, I'm looking for that authenticity, because I have uh, a, a broad and also rarefied sort of knowledge, because uh, obviously okay. I can only serve in one branch. Uh, where, where did you serve? Uh, I was in the uh, Army National Guard. I spent uh -huh. a year basically training as an active duty soldier before uh, coming back home. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, I never had the occasion uh, to go to combat. I, I, my terms of service were in between the two wars, so uh, uh -huh. I kind of got lucky there. I never got shot yeah. at. Yeah. But uh, when, I, when I see things like that, I, I have an awareness of these things. And my wife's father, for instance, was a firefighter. And when, when you have that sort of specialized knowledge, like, he would uh he would watch movies like Backdraft and was like oh that's that's wrong that's wrong and you <laughs> end up looking for stuff like that. Of and course. So what I what I liked about the uh, the last ship is a lot of it looked right from what I know. Now I wasn't a Navy guy, uh, but uh, my uncle was a Navy in the Navy. He told me a lot about some of this stuff, so it it got to be pretty interesting to watch this. Do you have uh, military consultants on a project like that to try and keep you as close to actuality as possible yes we have military consultants on on, on military projects and we have uh, doctors uh, consultants like uh, in in uh, uh, mr mercedes when we had the surgery the brain surgery mm -hmm. uh, we had a brain surgery it was his hands ah. doing the operation and we our prop master built the the, the head and the brain and uh, uh, and when we did the, when he cut the the, uh, the the bone the the skull and opened the skull all that was done so we had to have we always have consultants depending on what we're doing so on uh, on the last ship it was very interesting uh, I have never done a uh, uh, I've done World War Two movies but not really uh, 
contemporary military uh, project. And this was the first one. And uh, it all takes place on a destroyer. The destroyer goes out on the way. And uh, uh, for, for several months, he is in radio silence because he's far away in the Antarctic. And that's when the pandemic happens and when they finally reconnect with the rest of the world, half of the world doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. They had the lab uh, on, on the ship and on that ship, in that lab, they were trying to find the cure for the pandemic. Because when they left, that was a secret. The lab technicians, the, the doctors, the scientists, they knew that they have to do that experiment and try to come up with the source of that infection. So uh, that ship was everything. It, it was supposed to save the world, right? So uh, we worked very closely with the Navy. And uh, Los Angeles is not far away from San Diego, where there is the, uh, the biggest, after Norfolk, the, the second largest uh, Navy base. Uh, with dozens and dozens of, of ships. And because it was a destroyer, uh, we talked to them about using some destroyers. In the beginning, they said, oh, yes, because it was a great advertising for them, a series about the Navy. So instead of shooting commercials uh, during the Navy, they were very happy that they could give us the equipment so you could advertise the service of the Navy. But it didn't turn out this way because when we found out that they have to go and take that destroyer for exercises. They're going to the Mediterranean because there is a conflict in Iraq. Yeah. So uh, we ended up uh, having a dilemma. How do you shoot that series where the Navy tells you you have the ships but we need to shoot for three seasons or four seasons yeah. or five seasons. So I was able with Jack Bender uh, to convince uh, Michael Wright. Michael Wright was the head of, of TNT and I worked with him on Into the West. That's how we met for the first time. And then again, uh, uh, during the last shift. And uh, we decide, I kind of sold them on the fact that for a couple of millions of dollars, which is a lot of money, but you can, I can build the interior of that ship on stage. And you can shoot for years, and then you can add to those sets that, I, that we use in the first season and develop the next set. So uh, ultimately, instead of going um, and spending it was like $150,000, $200,000 extra going to San Diego to shoot on a ship. So how many days can you shoot? And then you have to come back, and then you have to shoot again. And then you don't get that ship, because those ships, it's the same class. It's a destroyer. Mm. But they were built in different times. They yeah. were built in 2005 and in 1998. So everything is a little different. The, the details are different. And when you shoot a movie, you know, this picture that's hanging here, right? That picture. Uh, it has to hang in the same place. Yeah, the picture has to has to look the same. When when we look at the kitchen in in, in the mess hall, it, everything has to be the same. So I spent probably five million dollars building those sets, and uh, uh, the Navy allowed us to visit those uh, those destroyers. We actually made copies of those destroyers. Uh, from uh, different pieces, we were able to put together that ideal ship that works for the story. Uh, all those hallways, uh, the mess hall. Uh, so after this initial huge big push of construction, uh, we created uh, so many sets that they've been able to shoot for five years. Hmm. They had additional sets because the story evolves and they go out on land and you have a lot of other locations but basically nearly everything that you saw in the series except the engine room and few other i think the engine room was the biggest set that we did not shoot on location uh, and uh, um, everything else was on stage uh, and uh, uh, the navy came that i remember 
the um, admirals uh, arrived one day and the secretary of the navy came he gave me a commemorating coin you know the coins that the military mm -hmm. exchange and uh, they were so impressed that they could not believe that it was built uh, from scratch it was not built from uh, by the navy it was built by us uh, my decorator uh, jeffrey kushan a great decorator he actually went to corpus christi where they cut and and uh, uh, they, they, they scrap out for scrap metal they take those destroyers where all the avionics and all the important electronics are taken out, everything else uh, is left there for grabs. So mm -hmm. before they were able to cut it in, into, into uh, razor blades, uh, uh, we took, uh, uh, you know, 40 footer trains, you know, of equipment that we had to clean, we had to get the lead off, we had to get all the asbestos out and all that. And from those pieces, I built the walls, but from those pieces, we're able to put Together, that big jigsaw puzzle, building a lot of things. Like if you know uh, something about ships, you have those huge doors, aluminum doors that uh, are able to withstand the pressure right. of the water. Right. If there, yes, if there is a, a, a hall, a, a hall, there's a hall in the hall in the waters. So all those, uh, I remember, it was like twelve thousand dollars. They were were nearly a ton, so you can't move them around. Mm -hmm. but those doors were authentic. The sizes of the hallways were authentic. We never cheated. We made something that is called the wild walls, that we move pieces of the walls so we can have the crew and the equipment. And uh, uh, it was so well uh, produced by us that the Navy wanted to keep it <laughs> and uh, use it for training. But it never happened because, you know, they, they shot for five years and after, you know, I think the secretary of the Navy was changed. It was a different government and, uh, you know, life goes on. They forget about the, the first initial meetings, but uh, they loved the series and uh, they were, they, it was a great advertising for the Navy. That's, that's impressive on a number of accounts. Like you said, one of the things was like, uh, you didn't cheat because uh, while I wasn't in the Navy, I had been on some naval vessels. Mm -hmm. And uh, space is at a premium, and so maintaining those constricted spaces and still being able to shoot, uh, get the project shot well, is uh, quite an achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, another and, thing, and as you know, as you know, it's not only the the walls, but there are pipes. That yes, every pipe has a reason why it's there. You know, you have the I forgot now the name of that uh, the the. the, the uh, oxygen suppressant uh, uh, equipment that you know there's a fire it sprays out this uh, fire suppressant uh, foam yes foam and, and all those things so they have to look like they really look uh, in real life and then you have to all the, uh, add all the graphics and the descriptions I mean it takes a couple of years to build a destroyer you know so we did it in a couple of months there's there's an extra obstacle now I know like uh, you had a very good relationship because the uh, the military is very happy um, to work on a project that's going to make them look favorably. And yes. traditionally do not want to work on a project that's going to make them look very poor. Uh, but in the case where you got to, where you had this good relationship, I also know that uh, they're very particular about letting you recreate uh, certain instrumentation because that is still considered to be classified material. Uh, Absolutely. How do you get as authentic as you can and still get around that constraint? Well, what we did is, when you have the control room, uh, the command, and I forgot which floor it is, we try to build everything the way it looks, but the, 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 uh, the software, the graphics, we didn't get it from the Navy, we reproduced it, we hmm. created our own. You know, when we went to look at the bridge of a destroyer, and they told us we can photograph everything we want, except the screens were covered with uh, okay. uh, with the special protection so when you have somebody from outside the uh, the ship uh, uh, like you have other workers who arrived there too right uh, this sensitive uh, equipment is covered so it could not be spied on so uh, we talked to our uh, our consultants and they would tell us if you have the, the 
this information on the screen, it should look more or less like this, and we designed it our own ways and, and how uh, closely we're to the authentic uh, imagery uh, was, uh, you know, all our knowledge had to be, you know, shifted into that uh, process. All right. Now that was very cool. Let me uh, let me ask you about something else here, uh, because you've worked on both film and TV, uh, yes. long running series. Something I found interesting is uh, uh, you you were on The Walking Dead, uh, which is uh, quite a quite a long series here. And I want to I want to get into a little bit of this and then uh, talk about your most recent project because. What I'm looking at here is a uh, dilation, a progression of time. Now, in The Walking Dead, obviously, you know, this is going to be going on for years of the showtime. And when we initially meet Rick Grimes, it's maybe been a week or so uh, since he, you know, he'd had his operation because he obviously didn't have a mu enough muscle atrophy that he just fell on the floor once he got out. But you, you can still see some signs of uh, disuse in the world that we're introduced to. And as we're going throughout the series, we've got to see a, a greater progression of degradation as we go along. Um, now, you're probably hoping with any series that you're doing that it's going to go for five years. How do you plan out, and what's your approach to doing something like that, where you're going to show a consistent progression of time in the environment that the actors are going to be living in here? Well, you know, I was asked to design the 11th season uh, of The Walking Dead. Ah. And uh, uh, I asked my agent, I said, you know, I don't think I want to design a continuous season if there's nothing new in that season. Precisely. And uh, if I have a chance to design this new world, uh, that is going to be the environment for uh, telling the story in that season, then I'm in. If I have to kind of repeat and continue, you know, from one forest scene to another forest scene to a little compound, then I'm not interested. But uh, it turned out that they want to have a different look, that they're going into what became the final season, and you'll see that it's going to end, uh, and that this new world, uh, which we're going to introduce as a commonwealth, is the last bastion of humanity. This is this, uh, as you, the, the viewers know the stories, they, they move on from one place to another because they lose those compounds because of, uh, um, uh, of the zombies, of the walkers. So uh, the concept of, uh, of the Commonwealth was such, uh, I had meetings with Angela Kang, the showrunner, and they were, she told me about how the story is going to evolve and what they're looking for. And uh, uh, just for the viewers, I have not seen uh, The Walking Dead before. I watched Frank Darabont's uh, pilot. I got fascinated how great it is. And then I skipped the 10 years. And uh, I met with Angela, and uh, she told me that this is the, the world that they want to introduce. This is the last bastion of uh, civilization. And there's going to be a twist that I cannot reveal now. And uh, I came up with an idea that I'm going to build a square of a Midwestern town, like in some place in Ohio, a small town, where the surrounding is all gone. The apocalypse took over. The, the walkers are everywhere. But they were, create, they were able to create with those walls and the compound that there is a, a form of life that has not changed. They advertise that. And uh, where is their headquarters. So it's not going to be a city hall because that city hall would be too normal. So I came up with an idea of building a 1885 uh, train station, a Midwestern <laughs> train station, a bazaar building with the interior of the train station, the entire interior of the great hall and different rooms for the station masters and all that. And this is where the headquarters uh, of the Commonwealth uh, has been. And outside in the square of the train station, you have uh, what you find in typical cities like that. Uh, there was an old fire uh, station. There were stores and shops and uh, how they have been operating. Uh, it's a 
kind of different in the different world. They had electricity because they had solar panels. So creating that world where they could tell the story for the next uh, uh, season was very interesting to me. And then there were other worlds that had to be created in a giant to the center one which was the Meridian compound, for example, you know, bad guys taking over a, an old factory, where first uh, one of the characters had, uh, had uh, their, uh, the, the, I think it was Maggie, she had uh, her compound there, and then they were chased out. So it, it goes from one place to another, but the Commonwealth was the main, uh, uh, I would say the main big set that appeared in that series. It started with a huge set of uh, underground uh, subway tunnels uh, for, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, with eight cars. Uh, where the, the cars were stuck underground, and of course, the walkers went, went after them. The whole team was trying to go from Bethesda to another location, and, and they were stuck because the trains uh, blocked the, the passage. So there's a lot of design concepts and ideas that have to go through it to be able to into that to be able to tell the story. I really like your approach there. Uh, as a as an artist and writer myself, I appreciate the the effort that goes into actually being a world builder. Uh, so I, I like the outlook that you have on that. Now, getting back to the question of the uh, the passage of time, uh, since you. Uh, you, you did that on Into the West, uh, but let's let's look at it from a movie perspective. Your latest project, I believe, is called uh, I'll Find You. Yes. And, uh, it takes place in the 30s and 40s in Poland. And uh, here you're telling the story of uh, a couple of people who end up getting separated by the war, but you've got a, a number of years that's going on here. How do you how do you work that uh, the passage of time into your set decoration, your set pieces, your environment? Well, this, this story is a, a story uh, of, a, of a group of young kids that are like 10, 11 years old who go to this music school. And those kids are from different nationalities. In that time in Poland, you had a mixture of uh, Catholics and Jews and, and, and Russians and Germans living in the same city. And uh, it happens that in this music school, which was run by an Austrian uh, uh, teacher, uh, this group of kids uh, uh, meet, uh, study together, and uh, there is a, a Christian boy, a Polish Christian boy, and a Polish Jewish girl, who is a daughter of a well-off well uh, merchant, who is uh, the owner of a department store. And uh, uh, they kind of don't like each other. There's a competition. The boy uh, feels that he cannot play the uh, strings, the, the violin, as the girl who is a virtuosa. We had this wonderful uh, actress uh, from New York who went to Juilliard. She studied violin and she went to drama school and uh, she was a musician and a great actress. And she was just, uh, I think, 14 years old. You know? Oh, wow. And, uh, and then uh, after in the, initially we introduced those characters with their kids, uh, uh, our uh, Robert, the, the hero, and uh, uh, Rachel, the heroine who stayed in, 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 in the city of Łódź, he goes away, he comes back uh, 10 years later, he's like 20 years old, and uh, uh, he expresses his love to, uh, to Rachel who actually is going to get engaged. She was gone for 10 years. And uh, uh, he, she, she liked him when they were kids, but uh, it was not really something that she has been thinking about for, for the next, for the 10 years when he was gone. And uh, the family, the Jewish family, Rachel's parents, they decide to leave uh, Poland uh, because the war, the, 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 the the situation in Europe, you know, with the the uh, Anschluss or the uh, Czech Republic was annexed by by Hitler. Uh, Austria was annexed before, uh, and uh, the family wants to uh, uh, travel to to Switzerland, where her fiance is living with with his parents. 
and uh, um, the morning of when they're supposed to leave, World War II starts, September 1st, 1939. And uh, um, the girl is uh, in hiding, the young boy helps her, helps the family, but the, the Nazis unfortunately find them uh, in that school, the school attic it, it was a place where they performed music uh, in secret from the, from the owner of the school. But this became a hiding place for the family. And unfortunately, the family is dragged out by the Nazis from there. And uh, she's sent to Auschwitz. And in Auschwitz, um, the commander of Auschwitz, based on authentic facts, the story is fictitious, but a lot of the things are based on historical events. Uh, in Auschwitz concentration camp, the commander of, of, of the camp from the prisoners that were brought from all over Europe, Jewish prisoners and gypsies, he would put an orchestra together. They would ask, the, the Nazis would ask, do you play an instrument? Yes, I play violin. So you go to the left. The others go to the chamber, the gas chamber. And uh, he had a, a women's orchestra. And uh, our character, I don't want to tell the story because I want people to, to, to see the movie, but uh, he is trying to find and rescue her. How he does it, I think you should see the movie. But um, talking about the historical research and historical accuracy, we shot in Poland uh, where the action takes place. We went to three different towns. I built the concentration camps on the location. I built another one on a location which was the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. So all the research that was done I had to do helped me understand what is the environment where it takes place. We had a lot of locations. We had beautiful palaces where the music school was, uh, a beautiful interiors, which now, for example, is the historical museum of the city that we shot, which was Łódź. Um, I, I'm from Poland originally. I came to the States in, in uh, the mid-80s on a Fulbright scholarship. And uh, uh, I was uh, studying lighting designing at the theater before I did movies. Uh, so so uh, going back to Poland after so many years was very interesting. Uh, Fred Roos, who was the producer, uh, who was uh, the famous producer, he did all the Godfathers and uh, a lot of uh, Francis Ford Coppola's movies and Sofia Coppola's movies. He's a producer and uh, he introduced me to Mm -hmm. Martha Coolidge, a wonderful uh, director, uh, and we went to Poland and we started putting it together. We had Polish crews, uh, a, a Polish cinematographer who also left Poland uh, earlier than I did. And I knew him as a teenager. Alexander Gruszynski, who lived in Copenhagen, and later we met in New York. He did Studio 54, uh, uh, then in the 90s in New York, and then he moved to to uh, Los Angeles, I moved in the 90s to, to, to Los Angeles, and we worked together on the craft, and then I introduced him to, to Martha, and Martha hired him, and we all worked together in Poland. So it's kind of an interesting journey. Now, going on to something that's uh, uh, less historical, less accurate, uh, since you had so much involvement with, uh, with Supernova, I didn't know that you'd actually built the ship, which was uh, really cool. Uh, when you do sci-fi genre, uh, your approach here, because you're creating elements that probably don't exist or it's technology that we're, we're thinking about maybe uh, having in the future or materials that don't uh, necessarily exist. Uh, what's your approach to that where you want something that looks futuristic but also believable in a way that the audience can still relate to it? Well, Supernova was very interesting because Supernova was a project written by David Campbell Wilson, who became a friend, and uh, directed uh, by one director who left the project, Jeffrey Wright. After a couple of months of, of developing the, the project and designing the ship, uh, in a sci-fi movie, everything has to be designed. It's like a period movie. 
Mm -hmm. you, create, you create the language. What's interesting about sci-fi movies is that when you go into the past and his, historical research, you do the historical research based on which country it is, where it takes place, and what's the time period. So if you do 14th century, you know you cannot put medieval 11th century furniture, but you can put uh, Renaissance furniture, you can put Baroque furniture, you know? Yeah, uh, that's the thing about historical is that you have it's, a... uh, actually, the, uh, actually, sorry, the other way around. Uh -huh. I, I that. When you do 14th century, you put 11th century because they exist, but you can't put something which is in the future. Right, because you've you got the it, context of history to work in. Of course, I, yes, I, yes, yes. I, I just did the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, 180. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, when you do a, 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 a sci-fi project, you create the language. You say, okay, you're out in deep space. How long does it take? We had a consultant from JPL. Uh, and with this consultant, we talked about the propulsion system, neutrinos, if anybody knows anything about that. Mm -hmm. So how is it possible that you could do the jump through, through the wormhole? And all those things... Every year, you know, this was done 20 years ago. So all the science and the knowledge and the advance of each futuristic sci-fi space movie pushes the envelope forward. You know, so when you look at Dune and you compare Dune to the last Star Wars, and then you compare the Star Wars to, to Star Trek, and then you mm -hmm. compare Star Trek to Star Trek from the 60s, you know, you have completely different worlds. You have completely different different language, visual language and, and storytelling. So um, the sci-fi world, uh, you know, like you said, you didn't know that we built the ship. We had to build everything. The only thing I used that really existed and I augmented it, that there's a sequence where they're mining a planet. There's a whole a mine on the planet. Uh, I was able to bring a couple of those huge drilling machines that are self-propelled, you know, they were automated, and we did a lot of changes to to update them to uh, to the futuristic look. But the function is the same. They had to drill, they had to have a conveyor belts, and this material had to be excavated and had to be pushed someplace where it could be sourced out. And then the, that's the history of on a mine, you know. <laughs> that's really neat, Neil. Like I, again, I was uh, I was shocked to hear that you had the spaceship because I usually think of that as something being the the purview of the FX department uh, but as you uh, rightly informed me the production design used to be the art department so that makes a lot more sense now yeah the production design is the part uh, is the uh, art department the special effects now we design those ships in 3d before yeah. we did it in models so I designed it they built the model the special effects uh, digital domain built the models but all the interiors I built on stage very neat now uh, two last questions for you uh, I want to discuss uh, Amish grace for a moment because oh. I, find, I find Amish grace interesting because uh, and I didn't think about it until I was like uh, looking through your reel and researching your projects and when I think about Amish Grace, I'm thinking, oh, well, here's a unique opportunity because the Amish live like they're in a period piece, but they still also live in the modern world. So now you've got to take these two juxtapositions of, of culture and put them together in one thing. Yes, and that was very interesting because uh, we, we did this project and... Uh, Normally you would say, oh, let's go to Pennsylvania. Let's go to the Amish world and we can rent an Amish house and we can uh, have the buggies and we can shoot in that world. But it was winter. We were in Los Angeles. <laughs> the studio wanted to shoot the movie now. That means in eight weeks or ten weeks. And uh, uh, we couldn't wait till spring and go to Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Los Angeles, in uh, in the valley, there's a, a horse country, an area with you have California oaks, you have green lawns, you have picket fences uh, for the horse farms. So we found a location where I built the infamous uh, schoolhouse where the murder took place. There was the story about the serial killer who came to a school and he said to himself, he had a dream, I think, or a, a, a premonition or a vision uh, 
that his child dies so he would kill boys uh, in that school. And mm -hmm. he came and gunned down, I think, six or seven boys. And it's based on a true story. It happened, unfortunately. And uh, uh, the, 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 the wife, uh, I mean, the mother of, of, uh, uh, of the, the slaughtered child uh, actually, in the end of the movie, uh, forgives the killer's wife and forgives the, 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 the horrible slaughter of his child, her child. Um, and we had to reproduce uh, what was interesting, <clears throat> as you mentioned, you know, they don't use electricity. Their machines are from a hundred years ago. They have horses, anything that is, it is powered by an animal uh, is, is good in the, uh, in the, in the world of, of the Amish culture and the Amish tradition, you know. So it was like going back in time, trying to find the right uh, uh, house. We found the right house. We had to re rebuild the house on the inside. We couldn't have lamps. We couldn't have sockets. We couldn't have uh, water because the water is pumped. You know, it's a very <laughs> different uh, thing. So you 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 you're trying to bring the past into the present day, as you mentioned. You know, they lived in the past, but in the twenty twenty that was twentieth century. It's funny. I hadn't I hadn't thought about. Uh what that would be like for somebody trying to create that until I was doing the research like, oh, wow, what a what an interesting set of problems you have to work around when uh, producing something like that. <laughs> so that that's what the production designer does, you know, because yeah. the director is a vision. He play he he direct actors and the cinematographer is there to capture that world and, and make sure that that world works for the story. But the designer has the the the, the create the, the playing field, you know. Mm -hmm. If 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 the designer wouldn't be there, there would be nothing to shoot, you know. That's right. You're the one setting the stage. I'm the one setting the stage. Yes. Yeah, I love which it. is great because you know the, the 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 world is my oyster, if I can say. You know, every time it's a different project. Every time is is a different peer, a different country. I love to travel. It you know takes me away from the family, but then I come back and. It's like a new world, you know. Uh, uh, my son was born uh, the day I had a big presentation with Steven Sp for, for Steven Spielberg uh, on Into the West. And every time uh, I meet uh, people from Amblin and they ask me, so when did we meet? I said, well, my son is now 14. Oh, no, he's now 17. So we met 17 years ago. And, you know, that, that brings me right into my last question here. And... Uh... Uh, as, as Wesley Snipes was telling my brother's class, uh, we get so boxed into thinking when we go to see the movies that there's the there's the guy working the camera and there's the people in front of the camera acting out the scenes. But the uh, a film is such a gigantic collaboration between so many skilled people, uh, all working in unison. It's probably the most collaborative art project there can be, putting all this together to make a... Um, a piece of entertainment for your, for your consumption and to, uh, to tell these stories with these characters. And uh, so what I want to ask, and look at all the opportunities it's given you, all this, all this travel, all these exciting projects to work on. How does somebody, uh, if there's anyone out there who wants to get involved uh, in the industry, how does one go about becoming a production designer? And do you have any specific advice you would give to somebody who wants to break into the field? Oh, yes, absolutely. No, I come from theater. I was uh, uh, raised in, in the theater culture mm -hmm. in Europe and Poland. And, uh, and uh, I remember my first uh, uh, ballet performance was when I saw, when I was five years old and I saw the Swan Lake. And I actually have a picture of the cast, you know, and the dancers. But uh, you have uh, schools, you have uh, universities, colleges that have theatrical programs and film programs. I would advise uh, people who are interested in the design process to start from theater, start from the classical theater, because that's where you will learn how to create the world. Because uh, in theater, you have a stage, an empty black stage, and you mm -hmm. have to create that world that Shakespeare or Moliere or Tennessee Williams. I did uh, Long Day's Journey and Tonight uh, uh, with... Uh, uh, Sylvia Miles, 
and uh, uh, actually no, Lang Tejin tonight with yeah Sylvia Miles, and uh, I did the Seagull with uh, Joanne Woodward, uh, Paul Newman's uh, uh, wife. Yeah. Uh, it was in in Woodstock, upstate New York, in the nineties, or uh, uh, sorry, late eighties. And uh, once once you get that uh, that background of uh, creating for stage one set after another, that that uh, world, then what you do for film or for television, you're actually doing that, but multiple times, because each scene has to have this other world that you're presenting. So I would say start from theater, maybe you stay with theater, it's theater and film design and TV is, is TV and, and film is the same. And uh, uh, you have programs, you have colleges, you have uh, art classes, so you have to have a liking to you have to, you have to like to design to draw, you know you have to have uh, uh, the, the the need of expressing yourself on paper. You know if you don't have that you, you won't be a designer. You know? And and then uh, you you do your couple of years of studies and you start working uh, as a as a you know uh, assistant. You have to learn how to draft and now it's computer drafting. I learned how to draft by hand. Uh, and uh, uh, you get into the business and, of course, practice and PA work and, uh, and you go up the ladder. All right, uh, Merrick, thank you so very much for uh, coming thank and you. gracing us with your time and all of your wonderful knowledge and expertise. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Nice meeting you and nice to talk to the audience. And I hope some of you will become designers in the future and uh, will, we'll, uh, you know, the bug is very interesting. You once you get the bug, you know, your life goes on, and you don't you go from one project to another, and uh, and uh, you don't see that uh, uh, the years pass by. You know, that's fantastic. And this is a career with a tremendous longevity to it. Uh, yes, you know, our actors can age out, but they will always need production design. So, uh, once again, thank you, and for everybody thank you. out there. Uh, uh, I'm Bracey with Comic Crusaders, and thank you all for joining us tonight.